in philosophy of mind, one of the theories that became extremely significant in the 20th century, even though it was supported earlier in the, in the modern era, is the identity theory. And in part one, we'll look at the explanation of what the theory is and the rationale behind it. In part two, we'll consider some objections to the identity theory. Okay, so what is it? The identity theory is the most simple theory of the mind. It says that the mind just is the brain. The mind and the brain are identical. It's the same thing. There's just one thing that we're talking about. The brain is the mind. Mental states are just brain states. And we have a, a few arguments for the identity theory um, shortened IT here. So one of the arguments is simply simplicity itself. So we have Occam's razor, for example, which can be stated in a wide variety of ways. You may have seen it in other ways, but a very simple way of stating it is to not propose an extra substance unless it's required. Keep things simple. The simplest explanation is the best explanation. Now, we use simplicity as a value, both in science and in philosophy, so it is reasonable to appeal to simplicity for support, and it's clear that the identity theory is the simplest theory of the mind. Now, what else can be said for the identity theory? One, uh, another argument then, this second argument, would be the success of scientific reduction in other areas. And what we're doing when we're reducing something, we're saying, oh, this something that might seem mysterious and odd is reduced to this other thing that is much more clear and understandable. So we're saying the mind is reduced to the brain with the identity theory. We did the same thing with lightning, for example. We've, we discovered that lightning is identical with a massive electrical shock. It's static electricity writ large, right? It's, it's, we reduce lightning then to an electrical phenomena, and that makes it much easier to predict, easy to understand why it, it acts the way it does. And once we simplify it from this mysterious thing to put it into the context of electrical theory is much easier to understand, right? Electrical theory helps both explain what's going on when we have lightning and predict lightning. So we're pretty good at predicting when there's going to be a thunderstorm and when there's just going to be rain without the lightning. Another example would be water. Water is H2O. Right? It's, it's hydrogen and oxygen. And so we reduce water to a chemical compound, and then we have the resources of chemical theory that will help explain and predict the characteristics of water. We can put water in certain circumstances where we can separate the hydrogen from the oxygen then. And because we know it's chemical components, we're able to do things that we wouldn't if we just considered water a, an element on its own, like the ancient Greeks did. So likewise, right, considering mental states to be brain states allows us to have better explanation of what's going on in the mind and better prediction of mental states. Third, and this is very significant argument here, is relying on that intimate connection of brain states and mental states. And this would be a kind of an argument by the best explanation, right? That this intimate connection is best explained by identity. And we'll, we'll have a, a, the main argument, we'll kind of summarize all these things into a main argument in just a moment. But the idea is that the identity theory has some support from neuroscience. Now, sometimes this is overstated a little bit by, by some people. For example, Niels Rauhut says, you know, this gives us overwhelming support for the identity theory. Now, I, we wouldn't say that, uh, but it, it does have support. 
And certainly we, uh, we understand things like a blow to the head or too much alcohol might cause memory loss, for example. Those of you who have experienced a concussion or drinking too much, right? You know the effect of this physical events, the physical alcohol in your system, the blow to the head, have on your mental states, which might include memory loss. Um, on the show Mythbusters, they once investigated what are sometimes called beer goggles, that idea and uh, I don't mean to be sexist here at all, but it's the classic stereotype of guys drinking too much at a bar and then they think they can take on anyone and win a fight and, and the women who drink too much and then suddenly all the guys look much more attractive than they did before they were drinking. Uh, that's the beer goggles effect and it, it, there does seem to be some merit to that idea. Of course, those two things go uh, both ways. Uh, guys can experience the, the increased physical attractiveness and, and women can uh, become more aggressive. Uh, you know, there's obviously same effects on everyone. Now, there are other neurological problems that show strong connections between the brain and the mind. So for example, there are physiological changes in the brains of Al Alzheimer's patients. We've seen this. We, with dementia, you can identify shrinkage of the brain sometimes. Uh, after somebody has had a stroke and there's been damage to the brain, there are changes in one's mental states. After automobile accidents with a head injury, all of these things indicate really strong connections between neurological issues and changes in the brain and changes in one's mind. Now, on the positive side, we have had some success with psychiatric medications. I've worked as a psychiatric nurse for several years, and sometimes it's very impressive the effects of Haldol on a psychotic patient when they're having a brief psychotic episode and, and have Melanoril uh, or Haldol or another medication that's antipsychotic and, and it brings them back to clarity. And uh, this, uh, that's one of the most dramatic effect. Of course, we have other medications for anxiety and depression and so on to various levels of success. So there is that strong connection between something going on physically and something going on mentally. Now, there are several other examples. Some of you have heard the story of Phineas Gage, a railroad worker in the mid-1800s who in 1848 had a horrible accident with a, uh, a pole that was used to, a blasting pole uh, used to uh, set, tamp down uh, dynamite so that they could blast rocks away to, to make a railroad go through a, an area. In any case, he had a terrible accident. A blasting pole uh, went right up through his left cheek and out the top of his head, which obviously destroyed much of his uh, left frontal lobe. And his personality was changed dramatically after that. He had a, a difficult time making it to work. He cussed a lot when previously he did not. He was rude to people when previously he seemed to be friendly. Now, it's amazing for one thing that he just survived, especially with the medical care available in the mid 1800s, uh, but he did and it was said that over time he actually kind of regained more of his personality and mellowed out and, and was able to hold jobs in his later years where he wasn't able to do that immediately after the accident. There are EEG measurements of our brain that tell us what's going on. There are MRIs uh, that indicate that there are certain brain events occurring when certain mental events are occurring. When we have positive memories, for example, or we become angry, or we're shown something that we might be hungry for, different parts of our brain are stimulated for those different mental states going on. In fact, there have been studies by social media companies, video game companies, advertising, marketing 
people who are doing these, this kind of research to see what's going on when somebody is engaging in the, their uh, watching their commercial, for example, or, or playing a video game or spending a lot of time on social media. We're exploring the effects of these things on the brain. There are physical changes in the brain that correspond to mental changes. All of these things we've mentioned indicate this. And so what's the best explanation of this? The best explanation is that mental states just are brain states, right? That the mind is identical to the brain. And so this leads us to that main argument that I promised you for the identity theory. So this is the big picture argument. And what we've been saying here in the, in the last few minutes is that the mind is intimately associated with the brain. So we've considered all these various cases that support this trauma to the head, the success of psychiatry, the effects of alcohol, uh, other chemicals in the brain, uh, illicit chemo uh, drugs. We've seen how MRIs and EEGs can assess the changes in one's brain after a stroke or after various diseases of the mind. And so because of this intimate association, it seems that the best explanation of that intimate connection between the mind and the brain is that the mind just is the brain. And so if that's the best explanation, we conclude, therefore, the mind just is the brain. And of course, that is the identity theory. So the identity theory is correct. For these reasons, we have strong support for the identity theory. However, there are some significant criticisms. We'll look at that in part two.